Welcome to the Distributed Alchemist course at Aalto University. I'm Jukka Suomela, and I'm teaching this course together with Juho Hirvonen. Hello everyone, I'm Juho Hirvonen. Welcome also on my behalf. In this course, we will study theoretical computer science from a new perspective. Imagine you're a node in the middle of a large graph. For example, think about a computer network. Each node is a computer, each edge is a communication link. Or maybe it's a social network, each node is a human being, and there are edges between two people who know each other. Or maybe it's a multicellular organism, each node is a cell, and there is an edge between two cells that can exchange biochemical signals with each other. No matter what the specific scenario, we will represent it as a graph in the usual mathematical sense. There is a set of nodes and there is a set of edges. And working together, the nodes are trying to accomplish something. Maybe we need to find a tree that can be used for spreading information, for routing and for navigation. Or maybe we need to form pairs for collaboration and sharing resources. Or Maybe we need to find a coloring of the nodes. That is, label the nodes with colors so that neighboring nodes have different colors. Well, why would we need to do this? It turns out that coloring is a very important primitive, especially in distributed systems. A coloring gives a schedule. For example, here we have a coloring with three colors, red, green, and blue. We can first make red nodes active. All other nodes are passive. Notice that the red nodes form an independent set. If you look at any active node, all of its neighbors are passive. So we will never have two active nodes next to each other. Active nodes can safely do whatever they want without any risk that the actions of their neighbors would conflict with them. Then we can make green nodes active. All other nodes are passive. Then blue nodes are active. All other nodes are passive. And now we're done. Each node had an opportunity to be active. If you have a coloring with k colors, we can go through all color classes in k time steps this way. So a coloring gives a schedule that we can use to coordinate the actions of the nodes. And a coloring with a small number of colors is good because it gives a short schedule. We can complete work quickly. So let's recap. We have a graph that consists of nodes and edges. The nodes need to work together to accomplish something. And we are theoretical computer scientists, so we interpret this so that the nodes need to solve some computational problem. Usually it's a graph problem. Finding a spanning tree, finding a matching, finding a proper vertex coloring, and so on. And we take a distributed perspective. Initially, each node is only aware of itself. And eventually, each node needs to figure out its own part of the solution. For example, if you do graph coloring, each node needs to know its own color. Let's go through this more carefully. This is critical. This is the key difference between the theory of distributed computing and the theory of classical centralized sequential computing. As I said in the beginning, each node is only aware of itself. Nobody knows the whole graph. Here I know that I'm here a node with five neighbors, that's it. I can exchange messages with my neighbors to learn more. And of course, all other nodes can do the same. Everyone can talk to their own neighbors to learn more. But we don't want to waste too much time doing communication. 
each communication step takes some time, and we want to minimize the number of communication rounds. So after some ideally small number of communication rounds, we want to stop. And when we stop, each node has to figure out its own part of the solution. If we are forming pairs, each node needs to know which of the neighbors is its pair. If we do graph coloring, each node needs to know its own color. And this is already enough for each node to know what to do. For example, if you use graph coloring for scheduling, if I know that my color is 5, I know that I can be safely active during time slot number 5. I don't need to know everyone's colors. Knowing my own color is enough to know when to act. So this is what we study in distributed algorithms. We are solving graph problems so that all nodes take part in the computation. Both input and output are distributed. Nobody knows the whole input. And each node only needs to know its own part of the output. This is very different from classical theoretical computer science, where we think that the whole input is stored in one place. It's given to one computer to be processed, and the whole output is then returned back. Usually we don't even pay any attention to this, but please note that this is a very strong assumption. We assume someone knows perfectly the entire state of the world. Someone knows the structure of the whole internet, or the structure of the global social network, and so on. And please note that this is also different from traditional parallel computing, where we may use multiple processors to solve the problem, but we nevertheless have the full input stored somewhere in one place. And eventually, we will store the whole solution in one place. So in pretty much all other areas of computer science, you take an outsider's view. You are an all-seeing entity sitting somewhere outside your input. You know everything. The only question is what to do with this information. While in distributed algorithms, we take an insider's view. We are sitting somewhere in the middle of a graph. We are one of possible millions of nodes, and we have no idea about the whole input. We can learn a bit more by talking to our neighbors. But since we'd like to solve problems fast, we usually don't want to wait until everyone knows everything. So we'd like to be able to produce at least our own part of the solution based on whatever we see in our local neighborhood. And this turns out to be one of the key concepts that we want to understand in this course. Locality. Fast distributed algorithms are necessarily highly localized. In a small number of communication steps, you can only get some information from your local neighborhood. Why is this? Well, just imagine an algorithm where in each round everyone tells all of its neighbors everything it knows so far. Initially, everyone just knows about itself. Then, after one round, everyone knows about everything within distance one. After two rounds, everyone knows about everything within distance two. After three rounds, everyone knows about everything within distance three, and so on. So, in T rounds, everyone can know at best everything up to distance t, and nothing more. So, if you stop after a small number of rounds, whatever you output will only depend on what you see close to you. Fast distributed algorithms are necessarily also highly localized. And this is a key question we are going to ask over and over again during this course. When is this enough? 
What can you do with only local information? And what cannot be solved locally? Which graph problems are local and which graph problems are global? Or, put otherwise, which problems can be solved fast in a distributed setting with only a small number of communication rounds? And which problems necessarily require a large number of rounds? So you can approach these questions from a purely graph theoretic perspective if you prefer that. Or you can think about computers, network connections, messages that you pass between nodes, and algorithms that process the messages, and so on. Whichever you do, you will get a new perspective on the theory of computing. You will learn to think like an insider instead of thinking like an outsider. So far, in many other courses, you have been reasoning about computational operations, like how many arithmetic operations or memory lookups or Turing machine steps are needed to solve something. The key resource has been computation. In this course, we will study an entirely different kind of a resource, communication. We will look at questions like how many communication steps are needed to solve something. And if you look at real-world computer networks in practice, you can see that communication steps are usually very expensive in comparison with computational steps. If you just try to get one bit of data from another computer sitting in your local network, it will take something like half a millisecond. Half a millisecond may not sound like much until you check how many arithmetic operations your computer could do in half a millisecond. And even for your old desktop computer, the answer can be easily one billion. So there can be a factor one billion difference between the cost of talking to other computers and doing some number crunching inside one computer. So if you have a bunch of nodes that are sitting in a network and that want to solve something together, the key limitation is often communication, not computation. And this is one of the key reasons why I want to make sure you learn how to design algorithms that are communication efficient. And we will also learn how to prove negative results that tell us about the fundamental limitations of computation in large networks. We will learn how to prove that some problems are inherently global. We show that there is no way to solve them in a small number of communication rounds by using only local information around you. And such results tell us something fundamental about nature. As they apply to any system that consists of entities that talk to each other. Not just about man-made systems like telecommunication networks. We can use the same principles to reason about biological systems or social networks. We can apply what we learn here to study job markets or animal populations. In particular, we can use what we learn here to study the fundamental limitations of such systems. What are things that you cannot do quickly, no matter what kind of a mechanism we use? So distributed computing is not only about computers. It is very much about understanding the mathematical foundations of all kinds of systems that consist of interacting entities.